Agents, let me take a practical view. Are some kind of entities that obtain data from some kind of other entities, and you may or may not call this an environment, process that data and then act. And those actions typically have consequences on the very things that have generated the data in the first place. So this kind of thing is sometimes called the um, perception action loop. It's widely studied in neuroscience and robotics for obvious reasons. I think it's important to note that the things that you can manipulate in the environment are not always directly or even fully observable. So they are not the same as the things that you observe and you, for most practical purposes, you're going to have to infer them from the data that you observe. Um, I think this is more than just a trivial subtlety. I think it's a kind of a core um, thing to keep in mind. So abstract models of agency abound, right? This has been studied for a long time. I mean, the cyberneticists in the 30s, when people were trying to shift their worldview from an energy-based physics to an information-based physics, they were interested in this. And it's been studied ever since, and probably for longer than that. So the way in which uh, people tend to like to model that um, is often by solving some kind of optimization problem. So you set the thing up in a way that you optimize some utility under a cost function and constraints on, on the cost. And um, the rest then is sort of just optimization, but people spend their careers on studying this optimization. And this pertains to many areas. So in machine learning, you have reinforcement learning. There, the kind of utility that you would use would be encoded in a reward function. Decision theory, you have also some kind of loss or risk function. Control theory, that same thing is called an error function. Game theory, you have your payoff matrix. The problem I see with this way of modeling things is that you have to come up with this utility function. Mathematically, you have to specify it. And that's not trivial. That's not obvious how you should write it down. And there are many, many different ways in which you can do that and many, many ways that are reasonable. Yeah, it kind of depends on the context and what you're thinking, and two people might think different things. So there's a large variety of measures that can magically be pulled out of, we like to say as physicists, pulled out of our sleeves, yeah, to be polite. <laughs> if there isn't a guiding principle as to how to choose these measures, then the resulting theories will never really be explanatory theories. They will just be descriptive theories. In particular, to see more complicated behaviors in your agents, you're going to have to put in more complicated utility functions or reward functions or what have you. And that is not satisfying for some people like me. <laughs> so what we really want is we want a theory where behaviors emerge from some simple first principles, just like we have in physics, right? in, in the physics that describes the non-living matter. We want the same thing also for this living matter. So I think there, to be serious, I think there's a real danger here of um, putting a belief into a measure, you know, like saying, okay, I've d either discovered this measure or I have thought really hard about this problem and I believe that this should be the way that I should measure this, either the cost or the utility or what have you. And then um, really b putting a belief into that and trying to propagate this measure and finding, you know, lots of uh, examples for with which this measure works. I think there's a real danger there and I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get attached to some measure or like proclaim that I have found the thing that uh, measures life, even though in the end I would like to find the first principles, but I think not like that, you know, like you have to, this is probably a long process, like you can't just say, oh yeah, there is this, this one quantity that we should just optimize, I don't know, you know, like maximum entropy production, minimum entropy production, and then you can argue 
I don't know. I think there's a real danger in that. I think it just like slows us down. And so what I would like to do instead, what I would like to propose instead is to look at the problem in a bit more expla uh, exploratory fashion. And to perhaps just say that things can't um, happen in an unlimited way. Physics limits what can happen. Yeah? So, for example, the speed of light will always limit how fast things can happen. For agents, the speed of light is probably not an issue, not so much, yeah? but there are other constraints. And so, because there are these constraints, we could then ask, um, can we explore those constraints and can these constraints give us some guiding principle as to what agents might want to optimize? And the argument here is simply that if an agent could think, set things up for themselves in such a way that it would allow them, even just in principle, to reach those physical limits, then really there would be no reason not to, because there's never a disadvantage in being able to do things more efficiently or faster or more robustly. There might be a disadvantage in doing things too efficiently because it might slow you down. It depends on the context, but there is never a disadvantage in being able to do it. And so you, there is no reason why you should set things up for yourself in such a way that you could never reach the physical limits. So therefore, it might make sense to assume that agents would set things up for themselves in a way that they can reach the physical limits. Okay, so that then um, opens up perhaps a kind of research agenda where you wanna explore physical limits to information processing and ask if some general rules for acquiring and processing information emerge from trying to come close to those physical limits. As a first step, I have looked at thermodynamic limits. Carlo is shaking his head. <laughs> no, he's nodding, I feel better now. <laughs> so, um, the first thing to note is that there is a general correspondence between information and work potential, so free the free energy difference. Um, this free energy difference would be the least amount of work that you have to put into a system to make a memory of some data that you're observing. So if X is your observable and M is your memory, then the smallest amount of work you need to do on the memory to capture this amount of information about this variable is um, given by, is proportional to the mutual information between your memory and this variable that you're trying to summarize. So in that sense, information is proportional to the least effort that you need to do to make a memory. And with that argument, you can say that uh, Shannon's right distortion theory, which gives you a constructive way of um, making a lossy compression of your data, can be motivated from a principle of least effort. You give me a distortion function, if I'm willing to live with that, and I'm willing to you know, take your distortion function, which is kind of your measure of not usefulness, so it can be translated into a utility. Yeah? If I'm willing to live with that, you give me your distortion function and then I give you back a representation of the data that captures um, the, the original data at, at least to a certain accuracy that's specified by your distortion function and that I can make with the least amount of effort. The information that you keep in your memory also allows you to extract work from the environment. Now remember that the stuff that you observe and the stuff that you can control or manipulate isn't necessarily the same thing. And you can't always observe all the things that you can manipulate. So you have to make an inference about those things. So it's really the information about a quantity that's relevant with respect to extracting that work that sets a limit on the utility of your memory. Combining those two things, you then see that the total dissipation that you encounter when you make a memory, which costs you something and which gives you a certain utility, will be lower bound by the total information that you capture at the temperature at which you do that minus the relevant, that part of that information that is relevant with ex respect to extracting the work, and you can extract that at a different temperature. 
So now you can say, well, okay, what happens if I minimize this limit? Then I have an optimization principle here. I'm now going to choose the mapping from the data to the representation of the data to the memory in such a way that it minimizes the lower bound. And here is again a simple example. This is an example of a Zillard engine with some correlations. So the total amount of information X carries about Y. You can move this partition in Y direction, but you can only measure X. And you have two thirds log two of information that you can capture about Y if you measure X. You can capture this if you take a three-state memory, but if you run this Zillard engine at a fixed temperature, you're actually better off taking a two-state memory because the cost is lower. So there's a trade-off between this cost and this benefit, and it depends on the ratio of the temperatures at which you uh, make the memory versus at which you extract the information. So here's a three-state memory. At the same temperature, you are better off with a two-state memory. Of course, the two-state memory has a certain amount of error, so you have less relevant information. Um, so you can change the temperature in this kind of the large engine, for example, by squeezing the thing from the side. You don't lose any correlations, but if you like take it out of the heat bath at the lower temperature here, then squeeze it from the sides isentropically, you can lower, you can increase the temperature and then stick it back into another heat bath at a higher temperature. And for engines like this, you can calculate the efficiency, which is here, and you see that the Carnot efficiency is reduced uh, proportional to how much irrelevant information you capture compared to how much relevant information you capture. So the more relevant information you capture, the more efficient you can be. Now, um, what happens if you, so you can use this to, to um, capture information about time series, and then an interesting detour I want to take is to connect back to what Carlo was saying. So from pushing the, the thermodynamic limits on um, making a memory, I find a representation that where I, I should capture predictive information. But that is also one of the main ideas that Carlo proposed in his relational quantum mechanics, one of the sort of axioms that you need to re-derive things from this agent point of view. And so I would like to ask whether these axioms really need to remain axioms or whether they can be themselves derived from this idea that observers just try to approach some physical limits. So we could also try to investigate other physical limits and see if we come up with other rules of information acquisition. And maybe they form a complete set of axioms that could then allow us to re-derive this quantum mechanics from them. So then we would have a self-consistent description of reality that includes this observer. I find that kind of curious. I would like to investigate that. So now we add these uh, inconvenient actions. When we do that, we can um, either just extract the work, yeah, like we did in the, the light engine, or we can act on the world in such a way that we can increase our work potential. Or we can do both things and combine them. These actions always depend on the context and what you are trying to achieve. I have to hurry up a little bit. So. Um, if the representation of the world that you take actually changes what is relevant to you in that world, then you see that these actions have to balance, optimal actions have to now balance between control and exploration of the future, uh, of, the, of the state space. So here's a very simple example of that. You have two states, you can hop in between them and your action sets the probability with which you will stay. And then if you look at such an information theoretically optimal action, this um, balance between control and exploration shows up in the way that um, those actions will choose only those um, probabilities that make the world controllable, but they will choose them with equal probability so you can still explore everything. That's of course quite different from just choosing random actions. So it's kind of a clever random policy. The thermodynamics of strongly coupled systems, if you have actions, then you're, you're strongly coupling to your environment. And the thermodynamics of these systems can be quite confusing. And together with Gavin, uh, we found that a nice, simple way to think about it is to look at um, what Pearl and others call a causal intervention. So here's a co-evolving system. So you can say your X is your memory, your Y is your environment. There are also external 
parameters that um, act on you, but you can ignore this for right now, so just focus on this. And then you want to ask for fluctuation theorems and uh, entropy production. And uh, you can take this joint distribution and pull it apart into the dynamics of the individual steps. And so you see that this joint distribution can be decomposed into these two processes here, where you fix the one system and you evolve the other system, times you fix the other system, you evolve the one system. But this shows you clearly, this diagram here, so this would be in reverse time, you know how if, when you want to derive a fluctuation theorem, you look at the forward probability and compare it to the reverse probability, first reverse, reverse time probability. And this decomposition here shows you that you want to compare this to this and not this to some part of this. And um, so with this decomposition, you can then write down the entropy production for, there's several things here that you're interested in. One is the entropy production for the joint system. One is the entropy production for just one of the subsystems conditioned on being able to observe the other subsystem, but they're still co-evolving. And the third thing you want to write down is just the entropy production for one of the subsystems if you can't observe the other subsystem. So that would be what uh, we call the joint entropy production, the marginal entropy production, and the conditional entropy production. And if you use the decomposition, then the one quantity that shows up here is this transfer dissipation, uh, which basically measures the difference that you have from the feedback. So if there was no feedback, then you would have this kind of fluctuation theorem. If, but with feedback, you have the conditional probabilities here. So it's a very kind of elegant way um, to sort things out in your head when you have these strongly coupled systems. Um, so I come to my conclusion. These thermodynamic, there are thermodynamic limits on agency. I think um, one thing that is pretty clear is that the thermodynamic limits um, posed on data representation really do imply some kind of optimal information strategy. So you want to retain relevant or predictive information and you want to discard the irrelevant bits. So basically, minimizing dissipation implies in some sense predictive inference. Uh, once you add actions, you have to be careful. Actions are always context dependent, but of course they do have thermodynamic consequences. So you can use these actions to increase the predictive power or the work potential that you have in your data representation. And if you do that, then your actions must balance between um, control and exploration. You can also just exploit the work potential, in which case you will decorrelate or you will make the world predict you and forget about you. So you will make the world be a predictive learner because you can change the world with your actions. It's kind of cute. Or you can combine both. And uh, one thing that I have not talked about and now I ran out of time is that really what uh, would be helpful is to classify action policies by the effects they have on the learnability of the environment. So some policies might lead me to always rediscovering things that I have forgotten. Others might lead me to a, um, a system that I'm co-evolving with that I can asymptotically learn more and more and more about. And I would like to know what it is about those policies that makes the one thing happen or that makes the other thing happen. And um, yeah, the thermodynamics of these strongly coupled systems that interact with their environment follow directly from this causal intervention in just a few simple lines. And thank you for listening, and I really want to thank FQX so much for their support. <laughs>